Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson. In this video, we're going to introduce determinants. So what is a determinant? Well, it's a tool that helps us determine if there's always a unique solution to a system. So if we think about the system AX equals B, where A is some matrix, A, B, C, D, where A, B, C, D are any real numbers. If I wanted to find a solution to the system, I would simply write the augmented matrix A augmented with whatever that right-hand side is. And for there always to be a solution for any B vector in our equation A equals B, then if I put this into row echelon form, there should be a pivot position for every column. So let's start to row reduce this matrix. I'm going to take this A, and I'm going to do some row operations. My first row operation is going to be to take R2 and subtract some ratio times R1. Well, first I take R1 and divide it by A. That will turn that first pivot position into a 1. And then I'm going to multiply it by C. That will give that a position C. And then I'll be able to cancel out this C. So when I do this operation, I take C minus C times A times A. And that gives me a 0 in this position. And the first row, of course, should stay the same. I'm going to do that same operation to the next value here. I'll take the R2 position minus C divided by A times B, the R1 position. And I'll get this value. And that should go right here. And now I'm essentially in row echelon form. And I said for there always to be a solution, no matter what that right-hand side of our equation would be, I'd have to have a pivot position for every column, which means this would have to be a pivot position, which means it would have to not be equal to 0. So this tells me that A is invertible if and only if, and there's my symbol for if and only if, that value d minus c over a times b is not equal to 0. And if I take that equation and multiply through the whole thing by a, I would get the equation a times d minus, and I'll just switch my product here, b times c is not equal to 0. And so what we can see is it's really this number value as that value that determines whether A is invertible. And so we call that value the determinant. So given some 2 by 2 matrix, the determinant of A, which we sometimes write like this, det A, and sometimes we'll write it like this, determinant of A, is equal to AD minus BC. It's this product, A times D, minus B times C, this product. That's the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. Here are two quick example problems. Pause the video quickly and see if you can calculate these two determinant values. Pause the video now. Now that you've had a chance to work on these two problems, let's go through them real quick. The first determinant should be this product, 2 times 2, minus this product, 3 times 4. The result is 4 minus 12, or negative 8. And the next one is this product, 2 times 3, which is 6, minus this product, 0 times 2, which is 0. Here I have a determinant value of 6. Now, that's great for 2 by 2, but what about larger square matrices? To find the determinant of a larger matrix, and remember these always have to be square matrices for us to calculate the determinant, we have a formula. We have a, a expansion algorithm to calculate the determinant. And so this formula is for the cofactor expansion along the first row. It says the determinant of A is equal to this expression. And so what does all this stuff mean? Well, let's look at some of the pieces. This piece right here is identifying the first row and the jth position. So that's what A sub 1J is. It's the element in our matrix A that is in the first row in the jth column. So I should say jth column, not position. And then I have this det A1J piece. And this says find the determinant of the matrix that's left, the matrix A, with the first row and the jth column 
removed. So it's taking out this row, taking out this column, and whatever that matrix you have left, take the determinant of that matrix, and that's what this debt A sub 1J is. And the very first term is saying negative 1 raised to some power, 1 plus whatever column is, and we just do this as we chug along through the columns. So this is summing up all these values for each column position. So it's an ugly formula. Now let's see what it actually looks like. So now I have a matrix A, and now I want to use my formula. So the first thing that we look at is that whole expression when j equals 1. We would get negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 power. And then we look at the a11 one, one position. Well, the a11 one, one position is just 1. It's this position. And then we look at a little subdeterminant. And I'm going to write it with my determinant notation, these straight vertical lines over here. And the determinant of what, what sub submatrix. Well, I am going to eliminate that first column and first row. And then I have this little matrix in here left over. And that's the determinant I'm going to look at. The determinant 1, 0, negative 1, 0. And so this is all that first expression. So that's the j equals 1 term. So now I go plus and do all, I repeat all that stuff with j equals 2. So this is negative 1 to the 1 plus 2 power. Now I'm looking for the a12 position. That's 2. And then I look for the determinant of the matrix I get when I eliminate the first row and this column, the jth column. I'm left with the determinant of 1, 0, 2, 0. So these are the values that are left over, this little 2 by 2 matrix. And so this would be my j equals 2 term, plus negative 1 raised to the 1 plus 3 times the a13, that position is 3, it's right here, and then times a little subdeterminant where I eliminate the first row and now the third column. And here I'm left with 1, 1, 2, negative 1. All right, and this is my expression. So why do we call this the cofactor expansion along the first row? Because once again, I'm starting with this term, and then I'm eliminating that row and column to find that subdeterminant, and then I'm going to the next position in that row and doing the same thing. Now one other thing to note is this negative 1 raised to some power. Because I'm just incrementing those powers up by 1 with each new term, it's essentially just alternating the signs. So because this position is 1 plus 1, it's 2, I would get a positive sign here. And now I have negative 1 raised to the third power, which will be a negative sign, and then one negative 1 to the fourth power, which will be a positive sign, and this is just going to alternate all throughout my matrix. And so really I'm just switching signs here. Now let's finish up my calculation. Once again, negative 1 raised to the second power is just positive 1, so that goes away. Times 1 also goes away. And now I should get this little subdeterminant. To do that I take this product, which is 0, minus this product, which is also 0. So I get 0 for my first term. Now I have minus 2 times 0 minus 0. And my last expression should be positive 1 times 3 times this little subdeterminant. So that's negative 1 minus 2. So 0, 0 plus 3 times negative 1 minus 2. So it looks like I can get a negative 9 for this value. And so this would be the number value of my determinant. And this is a key point here, as the determinant is a special number associated with a matrix. But it is a number value. It is an element in R, just a real number. Now, I have my big formula here that is defining now the cofactor expansion along the first row, but really I could modify that a little bit. And so I have two different versions here now. I have the cofactor expansion along the second row, and all I did was I looked inside of my formula and I changed all those first row pieces to twos. And this is a perfectly valid way to calculate the determinant as well. I don't have to expand along the first row, I can simply expand along the second row if I want. But I can even do it more in general. I could expand along the first column. Now I've switched my j's for i's. And I'm just going down the first column. So these are the columns that are fixed. And now I'm summing down that first column. 
So what these two formulas tell me is I can really expand out any row or any column following that same process. Now why would I want to do that? Well, let's look back at our example again. Now if I look at the same matrix, I might want to expand down the third column because I have several zeros in that third column. So if I did that expansion down that direction, I would start with this value. I have a positive sign associated that with position, so I go plus 3 times a subdeterminant where I eliminate the row and column that value is in. That's going to be 1, 1, 2, negative 1. And then I would go minus this position times sub subdeterminant, but minus 0 times anything is just 0. And then I would go plus 0 times some subdeterminant. But once again, because these leading coefficients here will be 0, I don't really have to even think about what those little mini determinants will be like. So now I can just look at this value. It will be 3 times negative 1 minus this product of 2. And so I will get, once again, negative 9, of course. Of course, this value has to be the same. But what this demonstrates is that if I choose the correct row or column to expand along, it might be much easier to calculate this determinant. Let's look at a bigger example to see if we can make use of that trick. So I have these two examples that I want to work through. So let's look at the first one. So in this first case, I could just expand out my first row if I wanted to, but I don't have any zero, and that would take a lot of work. If I think of what that first expansion would even look like, I'll put in my signs here. I get plus, minus, plus, and minus here. And if I just expand, I'll get 1 times a subdeterminant. But in this case, that subdeterminant will be 2, 3, 5, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, which is a 3 by 3 matrix. So in fact, if I actually wanted to calculate that determinant, I would have to break it down into smaller pieces as well. So you can quickly see that these problems will get very large very quickly. Here I'd have minus 2 times some determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix, plus 1 times some large determinant plus 1 times another large determinant. And that looks like a lot of work. But since I know that I can expand on any row or column, I'm going to expand along the last row, the fourth row. If I do that, I will get minus plus minus here. So this one's going to go minus plus minus plus. So those are going to be the signs in front of my coefficients. I'll have minus 0 times some stuff, plus 1 times and here I'll actually look at what happens when I eliminate this last row and this column. And I'll be left with the subdeterminant that looks like 1, 1, 1, 0, 3, 5, 1, 0, 1. And I'll get minus 0 times something plus 0 times something. The nice thing about expanding on this fourth row is I don't have to worry about any of these terms or this term. And so it looks like I really simplified this to just a determinant of a 3 by 3. And now I can just work on this problem. In fact, this one, I might also want to expand on that last row. Once again, I'll put my signs in here, plus, minus, plus. And so here I'd have plus 1 times this little subdeterminant, 1, 1, 3, 5, minus 0 times something plus 1 times another subdeterminant. In this case, it will be these ones here, 1, 1, 0, and 3. So this should simplify to 1 times 5 minus 3 plus 1 times 3 minus 0. So here I look like I have a value of 5. And of course, a great way to check your work is with Mathematica. In Mathematica, I can define my matrix to be, well, it looks like I have a, a 4 by 4, so I will use Control comma to establish new columns and Control enter to establish new rows. And then I will put in my values, 0, 2, 3, 5, my next row, 1, 0, 0, 1, and my last row, 0, 1, 0, 0. And now once I've defined my matrix there, I can just take my determinant. DET is our short for determinant. And I have that value of 5. So I can quickly verify my work in Mathematica. Or of course, you can use your calculator as well. Now let's look at the next example. Now this next example looks like another hard problem. But it turns out this one will simplify nicely. 
I'm going to expand down this very first column. It looks like I will get 2 times some subdeterminant. And that subdeterminant is this little 3 by 3 here, 3, 1, 2, 0, 1, 4, 0, 0, 4. And then the rest of my values would be zeros. I'm expanding on that first column because I have zero coefficients here. But now I have to find 2 times this little subdeterminant. Once again, I'm going to expand down that first column. I have my first 2, then I have that thing times 3 times another little subdeterminant. This time it's 1, 4, 0, 4. And the rest of the values will disappear. They will be 0 because I am multiplying them by leading coefficients of 0. Now, I have 2 times 3. And if I look at the determinant of this 2 by 2, it's just 1 times 4 minus 0, because this other product is also 0, so that also just goes away. So here I can see my final determinant value is 6 times 4, which is 24. But more importantly, hopefully I can see this little pattern that, that generate from here. The reason that I only had to calculate one term from each one of those sums is because all the rest of those values in those columns was equal to 0. And that will always be true when I have a matrix that has this form. This is a triangular matrix. It has values on my diagonal, and everything below my diagonal is all zeros. So anytime I have a triangular matrix, and there can be numbers above here as well, just zeros below that diagonal. Whenever I have this triangular matrix, then the determinant is just the product of these diagonal values. So more formally, if A is a triangular matrix, then the determinant of A is just the product of the entries on the main diagonal. So in this video, we've seen how to calculate the determinant of 2 by 2 matrices and also larger n by n matrices. We've also looked at a couple of shortcuts to help us calculate some of those determinants. And that concludes this video on determinants.